be here. Branford, you've played in all kinds of situations. You've played with Sting, you've played obviously on your own jazz records. What was special about playing with the Grateful Dead? What was special about playing with Jerry Garcia? Well, the, the Dead were essentially a 60s rock band, so it was almost impossible to have a band in the 60s that wasn't influenced by jazz. Not that they were going to be great jazz musicians, but they grew up listening to that type of music, so there was a very uh, improvisatory, you know, experimental nature to the way that they played. It was very interesting to be on the stage with them because the, they'd play the song and then it would just take off. But wasn't, wasn't Garcia also like one of the last great melodic improvisers? I mean, because a lot of jazz players today play on chords. That is, you know, they play almost an abstract version of the song, mm -hmm. but he play, developed the, the melody in a way that really goes back to the 20s almost, doesn't it? But that, that's the challenge about that's the challenge about advanced harmonic playing, though, is to find a way, even, for instance, you have a composer like Stravinsky, it's still very musical, even though it's not musical in the conventional sense. And Jerry actually experimented more without being too over, overly technical. There were times when he would play a lot of chromatic things and things that he thought really worked against the grain. Mm -hmm. He was a marvelously gifted melody maker. He was, he was a great soloist, and his solos were very musical, particularly on the, on the slower things. It's, it's, it was, I really, it was, it was a joy to, to play with him, and it was, it was actually more of a joy to listen to him. And his songwriting was very much like his playing. It was quirky, and that's what I enjoyed about listening to his songs. All right, that's the word, I, quirky is a good word. I remember the first time I heard Grateful Dead, I remember thinking, not knowing who the group was, and hearing it, and first thing it was an R&B band, and then thinking it was kind of like this jazz fusion group, just like no one idiom really defined who they were. That's what they are. Right. That's what they. That's what they are. Right. It's really sort of like something that happens on the stage. What was it like being on stage at that moment? You know, they're famous for you know the shows. Was it great every night? Was it? Oh no, it wasn't great every night. Some some nights it 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 just implodes. It would just <laughs> crash and it'd be like a ball of confusion. But the first time I played with them, in Nassau Coliseum, it was a very special night. It was it was really on, and. Uh, it was probably tough to play with the same guys for 25 years. But every time uh, Bruce Hornsby played with them or when I played with them, they seemed to get a little perky. You know? <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, they were real cool about it. Like, hey, what's up, man? You know, Jerry, hey, man, good to see you. Yeah, and then they'd start playing, and it, it would, it would kind of have an edge to it that I really enjoyed. They had a special relationship with their audience, too. I mean, could you sense that energy, that kind of thing happening when you were on stage? Yeah, with well, they, they, yeah, they, they have an, an audience. They've done something. That, that is completely rare in today's society. They are the last of the band. Well, there, there are other bands, for instance, uh, the Black Crows are starting to do that. They are a band that has gone out on the road and earned their audience, and they've earned their audience strictly from a musical standpoint. You know, and it's not a, a, a media-driven success. It's not a, a marketing tool. They went out and without, with virtually no visual representation in terms of video or interviews or television articles on them, they went out and sold their own tickets, sold their own albums, and consistently sold out 18,000 seat or greater uh, seat venues uh, based surely on the reputation that they had in the eyes of their fans. And also, they also like I'm sorry, I was going to say it also, I mean, the thing that sort of went with that was that it was kind of a crapshoot on what they would play and how they would play it and how it would go. And I mean, because I know from talking to the, the people who like went to lots of shows, they would like, like keep score, like, like baseball fans would. Yeah, they do. <laughs> right. They know how many times. When I played uh, Dark Star with them for the first time, I saw a guy. I, I, it was, ame it was ama amazing to me how immediately I became like a member of the band and all these rumors that I was going to join the band. And people would call me on my, my home phone. <laughs> <laughs> Hello? Dude. I heard you with the dead the other night. You realize, of course, they hadn't played Dark Star in six months. We're everywhere, man. You hear from other, you know, you hear from some other, I'm like, get out of here, you know, ring, hello, dude, you know, it's like amazing. <laughs> like, ultimately, that's the most interesting thing to me about the Grateful Dead. I mean, the way that the fans, in a sense, were the band, in a way, the, the, the relationship was that, like, integral to each other. Like, he has a great quote, Jerry Garcia, about, um, he said about licorice. He said, Our, we're like licorice. He said, there are people who like liquor, there are people who don't like licorice, but the people who like it really like it. Mm -hmm. And that, that was really, that's really impressive. Well, it's different. I mean, it's just, it's, it's different because, they're in, first of all, they're, they're, they're an uh, anomaly in today's society because they're, they're an old band. Mm -hmm. 
You know, they're old guys. They're well over the age of 25. <laughs> you know, they're well over the age of 25. Kids, over the age of 25. Yeah, yeah, you know, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know? So you know, many hey, of their hey, fans easy. aren't over the age of 25, <laughs> you, you, though, which is it, interesting. It's different when you're selling when you're selling music to teenagers who are fickle by nature, or when you're selling music to college students. And when you've transcended that, and you have actually withstood the test of time, and you're selling to everyone. So 40-year-olds are buying it, 19-year-olds are buying it, 30-year-olds are buying it, 20-year-olds are buying it, and they're buying it based on the reputation that the music has, mm -hmm. rather than what it represents to their society or it's like a Generation X type thing. It's actually a musical event. Right. When, uh, I did the last Rolling Stone interview with, with Jerry Garcia, and one of the sense I had about him was that this total kind of childlike openness. Would you say that that was characteristic of him on stage or him as a person when, when you were around him? Could you describe what he was like? I don't know if I would, if I could call it childlike. I know what you're saying when he talks, but um, musically, he he meant business, man. He you know he didn't smile much on stage. You know when he and I would hook up on a little line, you know he'd give me a little smile, grin, but a little little sly grin. But then, you know it was like that, you know like that jazz thing again. It was like a a taciturn acknowledgement of, of a little achievement or success. But then it was back to the matter at hand. You know, they were serious about their shows, and when they weren't going well, I mean, they'd, they'd get after each other during that. What the hell was that? What were we doing? That, this sounds awful. Let's do this, you know? <laughs> and I really like the idea that they would just get out there and call songs. Right. You know, like certain people say, okay, it's my turn to call songs, and they'd like, you know, um, Phil would start playing the bass line, or Weir would play something, and the song would start, and then the fans would say, oh, I know that song. It's not like with some people you follow around, you know you're going to hear the same songs in the same boring sequence night after night after night because that's more of a show. It's not a concert. It's, mm -hmm. They have a show and they have lights and I mean they, they just, it was like all of the, every, it, it was like being in the twilight zone on that. The thing that was, it, it goes back to that whole thing about what music represents. Mm -hmm. I mean music these days seems to represent something that's larger than the music itself. It seems to be a, a microcosm of a, a generation or a microcosm of how someone feels about their own life and like the punk thing, everyone who listened to a lot of punk music in my high school thought of themselves as iconoclasts. Hmm. And like most of them are now, you know, insurance brokers. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. it's, it's, that's the most amusing part of it. You know what I mean? Yeah, you know, they, 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 they're like, you know, more than what their fathers that they rebelled against were. But, you know, it's a, it, it, the music, it really was like one time I was asking a guy about punk music and finally said, look, man, in very exasperated tones, it's not about the music. It's not about the music. That's not the point. And I think with the dead, that it started with the music, and it was about the music. Did you have much of an interaction with that larger culture at all when you were around them? Like, did you get well, a side of it? Well, they started coming to my shows. Excellent. You know what I mean? They come to jazz <laughs> shows, and the difference was, like, when I was playing with Sting, the Sting fans would come to the jazz shows and kind of sit through it and go, "What the hell is this?" And then they'd come backstage and they'd say, "Yeah, I loved you with Sting. Good night." You know, <laughs> the dead fans who will you quite vi you can pretty much tell the deadheads when oh, they yeah. come in you Fairly know the sandals and, yeah. the, and then that's the, we're playing jazz and all of a sudden you see people in the audience <laughs> whoa screaming you know and they're like talking about the records that they bought since they heard me with Jerry and the boys I got all your records now and this is the one I like and play this song and every now and then you hear somebody in the back of the room say Dark star, dude. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so it's just like they, when they really like you with the band, they kind of they take you in. Do you feel like it really opened them up musically? Like it turned them on to, like, say, your stuff or other stuff that they might not normally have gotten to? It, it, it it's not that it, it opens them up musically because they're pretty they're pretty open to begin with. Right. That's, that's the one of the cool things right. you notice at a dead show that's completely different. The opening act is in, at a dead show is actually listened to. Mm -hmm. Whereas in other concerts, it's just something going on. It's background while the people literally turn their back to the audience and yeah, talk to each other, or go have a hot dog, or, or, yeah, or right. walk around, or sit on the phone. They actually sit down and they listen to the opening act, and no matter how many they were. And, and that's the first thing that caught me. It's like, wow, they're actually listening to what we're playing. You know, like we we did it. We we played a a New Year's show. With the, with the dead ones, with this band that I put together for it. Oh, that's like their big show, yeah. like the New Year's show. Yeah. And I had a band, I was in town actually playing with my jazz band, and I put together this band with Kevin Eubanks and uh, Bob Hurst and Jeff Watts, and it was all this music that Kevin and I wrote in like the late 70s when the fusion thing was really big. And we just brought this music back out and called the band the X-Men after the comic book. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And we started playing all this music, this really wild sound and stuff that's really like that Mahavishnu bridge between like mm -hmm. jazz and like mm -hmm. advanced harmony. And when I, 
we, we never played it again. And I still have Deadheads coming up saying, man, that music you guys played at that show back in 80, 82, I think it was, you know, when is that coming out on record? You know, and they have the tapes. That's one of the things I always did like about the Dead. I mean, the, the stuff that's going to come out of the vaults, it's going to be great.